So the promise of Web3, over the last few years, we've learned that it means something slightly different to different people. For most people, it begins with the foray into decentralized finance, with the promise of better investments than what you're getting from traditional markets. For other people, it's part of the NFT boom in this very unique mixture of art, of technology in the form of Web3 in the form of NFTs, and of finance. And what we've seen come out of this is that there's this common thread that's starting to bring all kinds of other industries into the fray. And I want to talk about some of those use cases today. My name is Nick Nassalm. I'm the head of product at Ava Labs. Um, and so as we, as we jump further into the promise of Web3, what do we get into? So we get into the use case of institutional finance, and I think we've seen a lot about that today. And that begins with this, you know, the, the advent of AML, KYC, KYB, um, even KYV, Know Your Validator, which is, which is starting to come into the fray and make it possible for institutional finance to start playing the decentralized finance world. On the other side of that, you have rails into institutional custody, and underlying that, you have tax reporting that allow for regulatory compliance. Right? If we move out of that, back more into the, old, into the art section, right, under this umbrella that we call culture, and culture is art, it's game, it's gamefi, it's, uh, it's film, it's music, it's really anything that's not in the deep tech world. So as you get into that, need, let's jump into music, right? We're starting to see what we're, what we're calling the creator economy, which is really empowering the musician or the band to create their IP and distribute it without having to go through a single or one of five major conglomerates, right? It's empowering the creator to really have better ownership over their IP. It's also empowering the consumer through micropayments just to pay for what they're actually consuming. And this model can translate into film as well, right? So in the film world, you have all these artists. Films are hard to make. They're hard to get financed, right? But you have a whole new model of decentralized finance, decentralized funding, where filmmakers can now have a wider net in order to fund their films, and in the same line of the distribution, right, create their own decentralized Netflix. Right? So you kind of have a version of decentralized Spotify for the musicians, decentralized Netflix for the filmmakers. This takes you right back into something like the gig economy, right, where you're connecting drivers, passengers. Uh, from there, right, it keeps going down. Now, I'm not considering regulatory compliance, any of those issues, right? Um, I think there's a lot of discussions on that. This is really just considering the technology. Some other use cases that are worth mentioning, right? Around identity, around the control of one's personal identity. And we're starting to see a lot of these use cases come from builders who want to build on Avalanche. Right? How do you control your identity, only release pieces, rather than giving it to every site? That, that you want to participate in, and then who knows what they're doing with your data. You know, we all know that it's, some of it's being sold. And even to realize the promise of decentralized ID, where you're not even transferring any data, right? There's just a validation through a zero-knowledge proof that, that, you know, that you are giving what you said you give. And these things are all way off in the future. Well, maybe not way off in the future, but they're in the future. And the discussion we're about to have is, how do we get from where we are now to realize all these promises of Web3. And the last one I'll discuss is the government use cases, which are particularly exciting because there's so much efficiencies to be gained in our, in our governments. And this typically looks like a public-private model where you're publishing a hash, right, to a public chain that's basically giving you an attestation of the state of that chain at a given moment. And then on the private chain, so that way if there's any tampering in the future, you can go back and see what the state was and you'll know about it. And on the private chain, it's usually efficiency. It's not using cryptocurrency. What it's typically using is, you know, some kind of, like, the, for, with our alliance with Deloitte, right, and the use cases we do with FEMA, it's how do we get disaster recovery funds to the people that need it as quickly as possible? And their team did an amazing job of putting that application together. 
And it does exactly that, which is it cuts down the efficiency through using the blockchain. So there's, in all these government departments, transparency into what the state is. It's also reducing clawbacks from the government side because they're not having to understand where the process was broken. It's a transparent, single um, proof of truth that everybody's looking at. It's the same one. So then the question is, how do we realize the promise of all these really unique use cases? So before we get into how we got to the future and how we solve to bring all this into reality, let's take a, a short trip back to where we came through. So outside the San Francisco Bay, as if you go in, under the bridge nautically to the northwest, there's a little area called the Potato Patch. And the Potato Patch is basically a mountain in the open sea underwater in the form of a sandbar. And in the 1800s, potato farmers up in the north Pioneers used to put their potatoes on boats because it was faster and they would travel down the coastline to get into the San Francisco to sell their potatoes. And they learned very quickly that there was this patch where there was any swell, it could get very big very quickly. What does the potato patch have to do with our experience in blockchain? Well, in September of 2020, Ava Labs ambitiously launched three blockchains to mainnet. And in that time, we have this thing in product, you don't know what you don't know until you know it, which is just once you get to mainnet, once you go live with the product, everything changes. And there was a period of deliberate learning, of deliberate navigation, right? And so you know, it, we were essentially building the sonar to understand what we needed to be able to fulfill the promises that we had made around scalability, around time to finality, and in that time, which became known as Apricot, which had five phases to it, we essentially built the sonar that allowed us to properly navigate the necessary technology in order to fulfill those promises. And once we started to get there, right, once the platform team was like, we're very proud of what we're doing, we, we have compelling products now, then it was, how do we connect? How do we create this clean rail from Ethereum to Avalanche? Right? And that came in the form of the Avalanche Bridge. Team started working on that in parallel in March. And there was basically four points on that, which was security, safety first. Right? And so we used this secure enclave technology in order to guarantee that these transfers around, across the bridge that were going back and forth would be secure and that people could trust it. Two, it had to be cost effective. The bridges that we had had in the past had multiple contracts being signed, were very expensive to use. With using the secure enclave technology and the single signing, it brought the cost way down. Three, it needed to be intuitive, right? You had to understand what you're doing. Bridges are notoriously, like you put your money in and you're like, oh no, what just happened? Where is it? What's the status? And so you know, the, the product design team put a lot of time into making sure that it was very clear at any given time what point you're at. And four, it had to be usable on the other side, which came in the form of an airdrop, right? So when you hit the ground, you were able to start transacting immediately. After that was built, then it was, okay, we need to open the doors, right? We need to invite everybody in. We need to really challenge them to push the limits on what's been built so we can continue the evolution of our own learning. And that was in the form of Avalanche Rush, which was an incentive program for both the builders to come over and really see the unique qualities of Avalanche in this platform, right around the novel consensus and all the other characteristics. And then also for the users to come across and give a chance to see what it felt like to have a transaction finish in just a few seconds. That brought us to where we are now, kind of this October, November timeframe. And in that time on, we've been building forward. And from there, We'll start to talk now, we'll, talk, we'll start to look at the strategy. This is just a summary. Launch the platform, create clean, rail, create clean rails, incentivize participation. I know it was a very long-winded way, winded way to get to all that. That's the, that's the takeaway. Okay, so let's look forward to strategy, right? What does our strategy look forward to get from where we are now to mass adoption? Right. And that's the goal here. It's to meet all those use cases to support every industry, every sector that's interested in building on Web3 and make it as easy as possible for them. 
So there's really just a three-point strategy. And it's, it's pretty straightforward. Number one, scale. Number two, make the, make the, the journey or the, the usability accessible to everybody. And number three, eliminate builder friction. Take away all the meta, all the burden of building on blockchains and make it very easy for builders to get to market quickly. So this basically breaks down into kind of a four-part product concerto where I'll talk about four products that Avalanche has been building, two of them launched, two of them brand new, that achieves this strategy. All right, let's start with scale. So the future is not a single blockchain, right? This kind of hit me over the head about six to eight months ago. There's not one blockchain to rule them all. The future is also not one size fits all, right? Every industry, every use case needs a specific type of blockchain. And we're solving for that in the form of subnets. Subnets, they provide theoretically infinite scalability you're essentially getting all the benefits of the underlying network layer, the consensus algorithm, everything that this team has spent the last two years and really decades before that coming up with. It guarantees you high throughput, low time to finality, and low transaction costs. So it gets through the industry because we have these, these use cases, right? The subnets are available now. You can use these. The custom VMs and the precompiles. So this is where we get to one size does not fit all, where you can really start to build your blockchain applications to the specific needs that you have. You know, GameFi is huge right now. We're seeing a ton of demand for it. But we get these requests like, we need 600 TPS, and at the same time, we need to keep our transaction costs really low. How do we achieve that? The answer is subnets, right? You build a subnet, you build custom VMs, in the precompiles, Aaron Buckwell put out a Medium article last week on precompiles, how to value with them. Patrick did a tweet storm after that. Very informative. With the precompiles, you can essentially get these throughput, right? Because you're building for gaming, and you can set your transaction costs. The other piece that we're currently and actively working on that will be coming up in the next quarter is wallet support for subnets, explorer support for subnets. Every subnet needs its own APIs. And finally, cross subnet to mainnet interoperability. OK. Accessibility. All right. So the first product that's going to achieve scalability, that's going to help us realize the promise of Web3, subnets. Subnets, custom VMs, precompiles, and then all the utilities that support them. These are called Tingy blocks. They're just these two by two yellow blocks. I think you start to see them in the US through more and more. I had the good fortune of living in Japan for a period of time. And what immediately struck me was two things. One, these yellow blocks, which are essentially cement braille, right? They come in this form. They also come in another form that has some long lines on them that says, like, if you go over to this side, there's danger. It's a curb or a, tr or a, rail or a railway for trains. These are everywhere in Tokyo. You can go anywhere in Tokyo, and there are these, these Tenji blocks for the visually impaired. Right? The second thing that hit me was their rail system. Tokyo is massive. Right? It's 12 billion people. And, and you can just see the foresight of how they built that rail system, and it runs incredibly efficiently. Right? It was built to grow with the city. If we are going to reach the promise of Web3, if we're going to reach mass adoption, we first need to make this commitment to accessibility. So this is a very simple kind of mind model I use on product, right? Just, just a quick, does it have utility? I mean, is it providing value for somebody? The second one, is it easy to use? If something has utility, but it's not easy to use, typically what you end up with is, is a niche market, right? Or a cult market of people that are wild about this thing, but only some people can figure out how to use it. In some cases, that's where we are in the crypto world right now. The last one, is it pretty? So beauty in the eye of the beholder, this one's really hard to nail down for people. But if you get all three, you've kind of hit the product trifecta 
and you are going to have a successful launch. This is one of the most, <laughs> this is the most, one of the most popular applications in crypto right now, and for good reason, right? I mean, utility knocked it out of the park. The, and the utility factor on this is so high, and you can just see that through the amount of money that moves through it. Ease of use? The try crypto to crypto v2 question mark, right? This is hard. Not only can I not give my mom this, but I couldn't give my sister this. I can't give a lot of people this, right? There's a lot that needs to be done here. And then when you use it, then something else pops up in the corner, and you got to figure out what that thing's doing, and it's often like giving you the information in a completely different currency, which you don't really understand, which then takes you to another place, which is the Explorer. And that's got one long address with some hash and then a second long address, right? And so you can start to see the process of this fragmentation for an experience that's going to be very hard to reach a mass market with. It's going to be very hard to real realize a lot of the use cases that we talked about in the beginning. So how do we solve for this problem? This is where we introduce Core. Core is short for the Core Experience. Core is a Web3 operating system for the Avalanche ecosystem. It's a carefully curated amalgamation of the wallet, the bridge, explores, it integrates the security, dApps, the idea to take everything, give it a very common look and feel, abstract away the blockchain as much as possible, right, while maintaining security. We have this saying in Avalabs, when is mass adoption going to happen? Mass adoption happens when you no longer know that you're using a blockchain. I'm going to walk through Core, right, quickly, and I'm just going to touch on a lot of aspects of it. So we call this the command center, right? And the goal here is that it's kind of like a cockpit. All the major things, all the common functions you do on a daily basis, you can do from here, right? Send, receive, buy. As you move through it, it's giving you a very common cycle of the same look and feel so that as you go to do an action, as you use it more and more, you get far more familiar with it, and it starts to feel less foreign. Portfolio, right? Just taking all your assets, folding them up, giving you a clear example of how much money you have. Also, giving you opportunity to then start to look at everything that's associated with an address, right? Anything that's on chain, whether it be farming, pooling, DeFi, borrowing, lending, NFTs, it's all going to roll up, giving you a complete view. Culture, so getting out of the finance stuff, right? We want the culture experience to be that, to be rich, to be visual, to give you a lot of feedback on what you're participating in. It'll support NFTs, it's going to support music, or anything that comes onto the blockchain is going to be represented in this place. And you can filter these things out to see what you want. Right? Experience is built around you. Security. So, you know, this core comes in, in, in three forms. It comes in a browser extension, it comes in a mobile wallet, and it comes in a web experience. All three of them have slightly different functionality. Web is by far going to have the biggest breadth. We all know that browser extensions are hot wallets. Hot wallets have inherent risks in them, right? We want to make sure that security is addressed up front. And there's a very deep ledger integration as a part of this wallet to make sure that the user has the ability to sign transactions securely. Bridging. So we took the Avalanche, the Avalanche bridge, the Ethereum to Avalanche experience, and we embedded it into every device. So now you can bridge from your browser extension, you can bridge from the mobile, you continue to bridge from the web. Using the same technology that supports five to billion dollars in locked assets, 40 billion dollars in total transfers, 240,000 transactions. The same intuitive UI, and then, you know, the kind of detail that we're talking about here is just when you're bridging, it takes a long time. It takes a long time for the Ethereum confirmations 
to go. And, and a lot of times you're frozen in that state. We don't want you to be frozen. So you can close this down, you can go about your business, and the activity will give you a flag, and then if you, if you want to know where you are, you go right back to it. Mouse over it, tell you where you are in the confirmation cycle, right? Intuitive interfaces that allow people to do what they want without having to jump over all these barriers or have a very fragmented experience. Swap, so we partner with Paraswap. And we're using their smart order routing and their um, unique asset allocation algorithms, right? So you can swap any asset very easily. Address book. Okay, so this one is one of those ones where it's like, this, this should be a no-brainer for us, but it's not necessarily, right? So every time you're gonna send to an address, any transaction you do, you're gonna have three options available to you. One, what are your recents? You know, just where are you sending to the most? Those are the ones we find people use. Two, create your own address book. Give it human readable names, right? Three, my account. So what we're finding is the more people adopt the Web3 experience, the more use cases that come into the Web3 experience, the more people are segregating accounts. Some people are creating 10, 15, 20 accounts for NFTs over here, borrow and lens over here. My accounts allows you to see all those accounts, see the value of those accounts, and also allows you to sw swap, uh, transfer between them very easily. And very simple, similar to your traditional accounts. Right? Make it easy for people to move their assets around. Buy. So this one's been on the list for a while and we get a lot of requests for it. Use fiat to buy crypto. Also embedded in core. Transaction approval. Kind of going through the same thing. But at the simplest case, you're just trying to transfer a currency for a good or service. You want to know what it costs, what the service fee is, what your subtotal is, and how much money is left in your account at the end of the day. Right? That's what you give it, is giving you. You're not having to figure out what 0 0.013 nano a box equals. Right? It's just whatever currency you're using. In our case, USD, Euros, all the currencies are supported. Watch list. So, by far the most used feature, and this is a mobile only feature, but we find that people are constantly checking their portfolio, right? What are my gains? Get in, see the information you need, nice graphs, deeper information if you need it, get out. The account switcher. So this is one of my favorites and we spent a lot of time trying to get this right. The goal here is to create as many accounts as you need as quickly as you want, right? So we wanted to be able to create 10 accounts in 15 seconds. That's all possible here. You can give your accounts human need readable names. Anytime you see an address, you can copy and paste it, and then you can see the balance, right? So you can start to de decipher which accounts are what, especially as they grow. We'll add additional functionality that'll let you mouse over it and start to see what's inside of it. It's the idea is to give you as much information as possible without having to go to a lot of places. So this is core, and this is our answer to the accessibility problem. And this is only our first release. We're going to be continually improving this and integrating more functionality into it. So where do we go to create more utility out of some of the existing products we have? Oh, real quick, here's a summary on core. Accessibility, these are the three products. So I'd like to announce native Bitcoin support inside the Avalanche ecosystem. So it is now possible for this, yeah. We're very excited too. Uh, so this $1 trillion asset now has more utility. All right, you can take it using the same avalanche bridge, the same one that's supporting with the secure enclave technology, available in core, all those assets. You can, you can take them into avalanche, and you can use them to earn, collateralize, borrow against in a different currency, participate in decentralized finance, use them to buy NFTs, anything, right? Your Bitcoin now has more utility, and it's all embedded into the same core experience in the bridge UI that's already intuitive that people, know how, people already know how to know. Again, the goal here is not to make the users relearn things. We want the experience to be consistent, reusable. So broaden the reach, 
keep evolving the products that we know are working, like the Avalanche Bridge, and create more utility for BTC. Again, the bottom of that triangle. We're always focused on the bottom of the triangle and also the second tier, and hopefully we get the third tier as well. Our final announcement, which was quietly leaked last, last week. Thank you. So this really goes to the third part of the strategy, which is how do we make it easier for builders? And I'm very excited about this partnership because it starts with validators, and that's what we launched last week. So you start to get push-button deployments around validators, but it evolves. Coming next will be APIs. So if you're launching dApps and you need APIs to support them, there'll be push-button deployments for that. On subnets and the sector-specific stuff, so when we talked about that game example, right, where you need 600 TPS, you need to keep your transaction costs very low, right? You have gaming subnets with the proper pre-compiles based on industry needs in a push-button deployment. Now we're starting to break down the barriers. Now we're starting to move towards mass adoption. And, and this is the kind of partnerships and efforts that it's going to take. OK, so clearly the teams have been very hard at work. Right? And we, are, you know, we, keep, we keep driving, and we, we keep following these strategies in order to make sure that we are meeting the needs of the community, meeting the needs of the builders. The one question I get more than any other, it's not like, you know, what's the future of decentralized finance or, you know, how will government and blockchains ultimately come together? It's, where's your roadmap, right? Constantly. People want to know where the roadmap is. So I'm happy to announce in the next two weeks we'll be launching a new website, and we will have a roadmap on it. But the roadmap's going to be slightly different. Instead of being a roadmap that looks towards future promises, Right? that guarantees, and this is kind of ubiquitous, especially in crypto, where it's like, in this future time, we will deliver these things, and then dates move, and, and a lot of the jargon around it is hard to understand. We're going to create a roadmap of delivery, right? which will just consist of everything that we're delivering out to the community and the value around it. So you can judge us not by future promises, but you can judge us by the value that's being delivered on, on a regular basis. So in closing, um, I'll leave you with this. So if you were to ask me what the single most important thing about our roadmap is, right? I mean, all of these strategies that we talked today, they're important. But it's one thing. It's people. It's, it's this community that's constantly pushing us to explore, right? To, to pick up the potatoes and understand that, that we need to make, we need to keep our promises around scalability, around accessibility. It's the innovators and the creators and the builders that are constantly pushing the envelope. It's our leadership team and their commitment to vision and the courage it takes to make very hard decisions that impact the direction. I mean, this, there's a lot of complex technology here. And it's the, it's the Avalabs team and the extended community around it. Right? I, I can't express how fortunate I am to work with such a talented group of people who are delivering a tremendous amount of work. Um, and if we can maintain this culture of delivery around this community and the constant pushing forward, then I do think we will realize the promise of Web3, and much likely sooner than we realize. Thank you for your time.